It's great to be incognito, but it could help just give a little more of a sense of a communal uh, book salon. Um, I have my tea, so please feel free to eat and drink, um, even if we can't smell the things that you're eating or, or hear the crunch, at least we can have a sense of being together in a book salon, um, sharing thoughts and um, ideas um, together. So as, as Shira mentioned, I actually think it was one of the first books that we did was um, Nicole Krause's uh, novel, Forest Dark. And it would be great to spend a few minutes talking about just the book as, as a book, just this collection uh, as a collection. But ultimately, most of what we're gonna be doing today and kind of the, the, the big idea of this, of this forum is to use these, um, these works of contemporary fiction to engage or re-engage, I should say, with classical Jewish texts, right? So it will be a book salon, but it's also, it's especially going to be an opportunity to learn Torah together, um, again, animated by, animated by the themes. Now, because it's a collection, um, it's hard to sort of cover the entire, um, the entire book. Uh, it's a bit different from, from a novel, but if you're familiar with Nicole Krass's writing, you know that she actually generally does not just tell a single strand of a chronological narrative, but really in all of her previous books, uh, in one way or another, she'll pick up a theme and then shift perspective or even shift stories entirely within the course of a novel. So as much as a collection is new uh, for Krauss, it's not entirely uh, sui generis. She's been, she's been experimenting with um, placing within the covers of one book, uh, different stories uh, and seeing what happens. Um, now, all of the stories uh, really do have some relationship to becoming a man. Um, and masculinity, gender, uh, sex, eros, all of those things are present. But I thought it might be good, at least in the discussion that I'm going to lead, to focus on the first story in the collection, Switzerland, and the final story in the collection. Um, I'm sorry, the final story, yeah, the final story is, is the title of, uh, of, the, um, of the book, uh, To Be a Man. I'm also, I also welcome comments and I wanna get everyone's thoughts on other stories as well. But I just think in the interest of time and especially in, in organizing one discussion that we all can participate in, we will focus primarily on those, on those two stories. Um, so, so let me open up by um, getting some thoughts and comments. It looks like Micah has one that he's written, but maybe you'll be willing to share it. And maybe we could just um, spend some time reacting to the book, reacting to the stories, um, even, you know, criticism in the conventional sense, this was great, this was not so great, uh, but also substantive thoughts in the book. So Mike, maybe you'll start us out. Sure, uh, I mean, I, I thought it was a little misleading advertising here. Uh, okay, there was one title, um, mostly it's about women and what they, their situations were sometimes with men, whatever, it was always focused on the woman. And so I felt completely misled. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm glad to get a, a woman's perspective, so I, I don't mind. Great. So we actually will think about um, that. I mean, that false advertising list, what you consider to be false advertising. Uh, I think actually many of the stories are about be, being a man, um, but from a woman's perspective. I mean, that's precisely what's so interesting. Even when the perspective is supposed to be a male perspective, the writer is still um, a woman. Uh, I mean, generally, that's it's a female narrator that's giving us that. So a woman can uh, tell us what it means to be a man. And in fact, a woman, right, can tell us things that a man uh, might not know about being a man, <laughs> uh, sort of paradoxically. So I think that's that's one of the things we're going to to explore. Also with the classical Jewish texts, which for the most part adopt a male perspective, even if they're writing about women, uh, and of course, if they're writing about men. Okay, other, other reactions and thoughts about, about the collection? Surely someone's ready to either rip it apart or praise it to high heaven.
I guess I'm an outlier here because I didn't read the book. <laughs> so we'll start with comments by people uh, who've read the book, but there is an old tradition of book clubs to comment even if you haven't uh, read the book. <laughs> but but let's first get some comments from, <laughs> from people who, who've read the book or even, even just a, a, a couple of the stories uh, which have been excerpted. Yeah, Marsha, or sorry, yeah. Hanamalka. <laughs> <laughs> preferred. Um, yes. Thank you. Um, I, I'm not a short story fan in general. If you would ask me, what do you read? Um, I couldn't put it down. I read it cover to cover. Hmm. Um, and I was very appreciative of her explorations. Um, I was confused a bit by some, I, I have to admit. But what I absolutely admired were, there were lines that I, yeah, I took the Kindle version, you know, literally pulled out and sent to myself and said, oh my God, how long did it take her to craft this one marvelous thought? And I was just very, very appreciative. No, I've never read anything by her before. So I was, um, I, I was intrigued, and now that you're talking about the other things, I'm like, yeah, I'm probably going to go and uh, <laughs> start getting a few more books on the uh, on the computer. Any any sentences in particular that you just maybe one sentence that you that you want to uh, share? Yeah, I, I would have to go and and uh, check. My okay, I won't put you on the spot. The, the observation about the change of time. Um, and if you're going to ask me which of the stories it was. <laughs> I, um, the clocks had been turned back a week earlier and I still hadn't gotten used to the dark coming in so early. I always feel a little pang of hurt that first day when darkness falls without warning. It's the slight sickening feeling of being reminded of the reckless authority of time, of losing your bearings in a world whose dimensions you thought you'd learn to live with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great, and it certainly feels timely when we suddenly find ourselves, you know, in that season again. But also, this is very much part of the process of being a man, especially in the last story. You know, this is a inevitable process, just as inevitable as the sun going down earlier and earlier um, in the winter season. Kelsey, I saw that you had your hand up. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with Hannah Malka. I'm, I'm not a short story reader. I tend to, you know, go for the long novels, but I also could not put this one down. I, I just kept, kept, you know, saying, well, I'll just read one more. Um, and, uh, and, and I had to read it with, with my yellow marker in my hand, which I don't usually mark up the books, but this one was like, yeah, there's some sentences here I need to come back to. And, uh, you know, also like Hannah Malka, I was I was thinking about the time element. There was there was one sentence in um, Zusia on the Roof that I, I marked. It was about Jews decided to live outside of history. History is what happened to other people while the Jews were waiting for Mashiach to come. So it's a little reference to time again. So we had uh, similar experiences. National time. Great. Thank you. Any other any other reactions to the the collection that someone wants to share at this juncture? Of course, there'll be plenty of opportunities to do so once we get the uh, the source, the learning discussion going. I, I thought it's Louis Horschbach. I thought the last story was very consistent with your notion of the way she writes because it's five different stories in one story. And I thought that was, um, I mean, to me, that's what makes her a great writer is that um, she bounces around so much, you really have to pay attention. And, but her language is so fantastic and eloquent and insightful that you have to pay attention all the time. And you have to, you really have to concentrate on where you are. You can't get carried away with a long novel. You have to, you have to really watch where she is all the time. Yes, thanks for that. Um, the the interlocking storylines is definitely, again, indicative of, 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 of how she writes. And also the shifting of perspective. I mean, in that example, um, the last story, it seems that, yes, there are these different interlocking 
stories or parallel stories for that matter. Uh, but I think it's, it seems clear that actually it's about the same person, um, the narrator, that the narrator moves from the first person to the third person uh, and back, which also has a certain, like a really interesting distancing and, and, and closing effect, you know, where you sit within that eye of the narrator and then you move out to the, the third person. So there's so much to discuss, and and also in terms of the sources, we're going to look at again, in 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 you know in telling the story of what it means to be a man or a woman, right? To what extent does perspective and shifting perspective um, matter, and maybe even define how how the material makes sense? So thanks for that. Yes, Nancy. Just that, yeah. um, there's, there is so much of generations in the stories. Um, grandparents, the, the characters tend to be of one age group, but then there are children. And well, they're not only of one age group, but I think that the perspective of how all this that's been talked about in each of the stories is for the children or for the, the um, generation before. There's a lot of interplay between all the generations that I found very interesting. Yes, thank you. Great, so maybe we'll get going with some sources uh, and then our, our comments can, um, can move from there. I, I wanted to again start with actually the, the, um, the final story, uh, To Be a Man, the title you know, the title story, so to speak. Um, and I wanted to first go back to the very beginning, uh, quite literally the very beginning. And that is the account of the creation of Adam and Eve, of man and woman uh, in, the, in the Torah. Now this is actually um, explicit, you know, explicitly referenced in the story. Um, we'll get to the precise, um, um, you know, the, the significance of this precise quote, but she mentions ribs and the creation of men and women because both the narrator here in the third person uh, and this German boxer slash um, person who works at a, um, a newspaper or publisher, um, both have these broken ribs, right? So have that in the background as we start looking and learning some sources that we all know very well, but somehow each time we look at them, we learn something new. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen, but if you have, if you prefer to look at it in an, on, a, on another device, we'll be starting, or <laughs> actually as a printed out piece of paper, we'll be starting on, uh, on page one. Can everyone see that? I just wanna make sure that the screen share went through. Excellent, okay. So the, the classic account of the creation of Adam and Eve um, is we find it in Breshit, the second chapter of Breshit in Genesis 2, right? Um, you know, there's a particularly Christianized reading where there's even an apple involved. Uh, but even leading that, leaving that aside, right? Normally, if you were to ask any school child or any person who is minimally literate um, in, in the Bible, they will tell you that Adam was created first. Um, Eve was taken from his rib uh, later. Um, and that dynamic, right, of how the order in which the creation took place and the way in which uh, it, it took place has been formative, right, um, for throughout human history and particularly, of course, um, you know, places in which this story is, is so formative in the West and even in the Middle East, right, uh, the story of Adam and Eve. So I thought we could look at um, some of these sukim, some of these verses, uh, carefully, and um, and see what see what happens. So I'm going to read a little, and then maybe uh, we could have some volunteers uh, to read some more. Okay. So let's start. Actually, if everyone can see where my, uh, let's start at the beginning. And by the way, the translation is. Um, is um, Robert Alter's marvelous translation with one small difference. He translates Adam as human for actually very good philological and literary uh, reasons, but I've translated it as earthling. Um, 
for obvious reasons, right? Adam is taken from the earth, but it also it it, it uh, allow it helps us remember, right? How strange and almost sci-fi the story of the first human is, right? This is not just a person like we are people, right? By definition, right, the first human that is created is going to maybe uh, define what humanity will be like later, but is fundamentally different because human history hasn't happened yet. And also because he is alone. He is the first human, right? And that, you know, I want to capture this sort of difference between us and this human, Adam, right? And that's why we're going to call him the earthling. And the Lord God said, it is not good for the earthling to be alone. I shall make him a sustainer beside him, often translated as a helper opposite him. And the Lord God fashioned from the soil each beast of the field and each fowl of the heavens and brought each to the earthling to see what he would call it. And whatever the earthling called the living creature, that was its name. And the earthling called names to all the cattle and to the fowl of the heavens and to all the beasts of the field. But for the earthling, no sustainer beside him was found. Let me stop there for a second and just ask everyone a basic literary question, right? What is the connection, right, between this remark by God, it's not good for the earthling to be alone, I shall make him sustainer beside him, um, and this description of God fashioning all these other creatures and bringing them before Adam before the earthling to see what they he would call them. And please unmute yourself because I can't see everybody. So if you want to share, just go ahead and unmute. Is this kind of an interruption? I think, I, yeah. I think Hashem is not a test, but by example, is showing Adam you are alone. And How so? Is, there's a need for an Ezekinegdo. And how Adam, does that Adam feels a need? By he sees all the all the animals that he's naming, there seems to be a male and female. You know, why not me? Good, excellent. So although the text doesn't explicitly say that, you know, the man and the woman, you know, the male and female, um, you know, chicken and cow. Um, comes before him, we could definitely have that in our head. And in fact, that's actually how it's described with Noah, right? When these animals come in front of him. So just by seeing bustling animal life, right? He will feel maybe even more alone, right? And, 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 and feel the need for a helper. Um, yes. I think I also understood at one point, learned that as Adam named the creatures as the creatures passed in front of Adam. Um, he was evaluating their potentials as partners. So maybe he was learning about himself and his needs and um, maybe the, the paradigm for the helper needed to be created. Excellent. Yes. So we will actually take the opportunity to read a midrash um, um, very quickly. That says exactly what you said. It's much more explicit uh, than the way you put it. And you know, as we like to say, there are many trigger warnings in what we'll be um, <laughs> learning together. Uh, but but there but by the sort of the the shock value of some of these passages, we learned some interesting truths. So Rabbi Eliezer said, "What is written? This one at last, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, which is what Adam is going to say once he is introduced to uh, Chava to Eve." This teaches that Adam copulated with all of the animals and his mind was not cooled until he had sex with Eve, right? So certainly a shocking image, right, of bestiality as he tries and sees what is going to be the proper partner and he only realizes, um, you know, he's only, only able to appreciate Chava, Eve, after going through that process. So even though in our reading we're not yet there at the end, um, we can appreciate that there is some continuity between um, the realization that Adam is alone, that God tells us, the reader, right? The description of all of these animals, which only serves to underline the aloneness of this human, 
because this human is different than all the animals. It's a human, right? It's a, the, the, and that you know underlines the aloneness, and therefore the the text continues how God creates um, woman Eve. So let, let's continue with that, um, uh, and, and I'll just read a, l- a little bit more. And the Lord God cast a deep slumber on the human, and he slept, or the earthling. And he took one of his ribs and closed over the flesh where it had been. And the Lord God built the rib, built the rib he had taken from the earthling into a woman, and he brought her to the earthling. And the earthling said, this one at last, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, this one shall be called woman, right? Or from man, for from man was this one taken. Therefore does the man leave his father and his mother and cling to his wife, and they become one flesh. And the two of them were naked, the earthling and his woman, and they were not ashamed, right? And then, of course, we know the continuation leading up to the first uh, sin uh, with, um, with the tree, okay? So this is the classic account uh, of the creation of Adam and particularly of Chava, right, of Eve, out of Adam. Now, there is a certain romance, perhaps, to this story, right, from one perspective. Um, And this is expressed both in these sort of like folk sayings. Therefore, does a man leave his father and his mother and cling to his wife, and they become one flesh. And also in Adam's own reaction, right? This one at last, Zotapam, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. There's a sense of, you know, finally coming together after feeling so alone that the, the, the passage uh, captures, right? Now, just again, not yet going back to the story um, in, the, in the Krauss novel, we have in, that, in, in the story of uh, To Be a Man, we have, a, you know, a account of a coupling, right? Between the narrator and, and this German um, there are moments of, you know, literal union uh, between these two people, but it's much more troubled, right? Um, there, there is a lot of friction. Um, the friction sometimes seems, as one would expect, to kind of prevent a kind of romantic union. But on the other ha- hand, right, curiously, it seems to heighten, right, the relationship between these two uh, humans as they sort of pass each other, come together, come apart uh, in, in the story. Now, in order to kind of better appreciate actually the complex um, view of a relation, relationship between two lovers, right? The man and the woman that the Torah is giving us, I want to remind you that this isn't the only account of how Adam and Chava were created, right? In the first chapter of Genesis, we have one verse, um, that describes the creation of man and woman, uh, male and female, to be more precise. And we don't have any of this account there, right? Does anyone actually want to read just this one verse? This is source number two. You can unmute yourself and grace us with your voice. Anyone? And God created the earthling in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Okay, excellent, thank you. So it's a very different account, right? All we have is a description of God creating the earthling in his image and sort of two genders, right? Two sexes, male and female. We don't have any indication that first man was created and then female. We don't have any indication that this was the result of a kind of aloneness in the first, uh, in, in the in the first earthling, uh, but rather in one pasuk, in one verse, right? Created earthling in his image, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, there's also a grammatical problem, which I've underlined. It's not a problem, but it allows us to appreciate the complexity of this pasuk, right? It it first says that he created him, right? Male and female. Uh, uh, he, the earthling, and then male and female, he created them. And within this movement from the singular to the plural, there is an entire world, right? What, what are we to make of this, right? How do we understand 
this creation of one unity, right? One earthling, um, two then two iterations, right? Of that, of that creature, right? The plural them, right? So this, you know, th these two different accounts um, have been fodder for th literally thousands of years of unbelievably creative exegesis and interpretation. How do we explain what's happening here in Genesis 1 versus Genesis 2, right? Particularly in terms of the creation of male and female. How does this work? Now, I want to share a pretty well-known um, rabbinic source, um, relatively well-known, well actually. And even those of you who know it, um, perhaps if you know it too well, you forget how bizarre it is. Um, and I wanna, again, sort of heighten the strangeness of this, of this explanation basically for Genesis one, describing the creation of the earthling male and female, he created them, and the much longer account in the second chapter of Breshit. So this is a passage from uh, Breshit Rabbah, a classic midrash on uh, the book of Genesis composed by Amoraim. These are rabbis who lived in kind of the second stage of rabbinic history um, from the third century to the fifth century of the common era. And they lived in Eretz Israel. They lived in the land of Israel uh, for the most part, almost all of them. So look at two opinions here. There's a classic debate between these rabbis. Said Rabbi Yirmiya ben Elazar, the son of Elazar, when the Holy One, Blessed One created the first earthling, he created him as an, an, as an androgynous. This is what is written, male and female, he created them. So in other words, the initial creature was a creature that was, had two sexes at once. Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachman said, he created the earthling with two faces and he sawed them and made backs, one here and one there. So initially we have a kind of Siamese twin, um, where one of the twins is male and one of the twins is female, but they're entirely connected together. And only, right, later does God saw them in half, right? So just to sort of sum up these two opinions, which seem to be primarily animated by this, these two different accounts, right? Both of them understand Genesis 1 as describing a human, that was created somehow with two genders, either, right, as a two-sexed, you know, single creature or as a kind of, you know, double connected twin, so to speak. And then Genesis 2, which looks like, right, it's just, um, you know, a single male that later a female is taken from his uh, uh, rib and created is in fact actually right, part of this process, right? And that's what the end of the Midrash deals with, right? They raised a contradiction. What if the verse, and God took one of his ribs? He answered them, this means that, sorry, God took one of the sides. Ribs is a mistranslation according to this, this view. God simply saw this creature in half, right? Um, and there's a linguistic proof for, for this point. Are there any questions thus far? I'm gonna say just a bit more and then we can have a broader dis discussion about these sources. And again, not, I can't, yes. I'm not buying the Leisha Um I like, I, I have no problem with the way, let's say you wanna call Adam one and Adam Adam two. So one, one is, let's say the novel as in book approach. The other one is the Reader's Digest version. There's no contradiction. So that is a classic. Um, that is a classic explanation that actually was already taken up by the medieval parshanim, which is that the first, um, you know, Genesis one is doesn't go into any detail, right? Just gives you the cliff notes that male and female were created, right? It doesn't tell you that it was a long process, right? It doesn't tell you that first there was a man and then a rib was taken and there was a female. Rather, right, it just gives you the basics and only in the second chapter, uh, that's Genesis 2, um, and that gives you another account. Now, even if that's the case, and perhaps that's the best reading uh, to make sense of these 
you know, seemingly contradictory ver verses, we do need to ask ourselves why, right? Why is it told in this way? Um, is it, right, is there a reason why, right, the first account is even shared with us without giving any hint at all, right, that there is a process? Is there anything that could be made of that? Or this is just sort of the strategies of writing. Now, I, you know, I like your bluntness in saying you don't buy Genesis Rabbah. Um, I'm not here to sort of argue what the correct uh, meaning of the text is, but I am very interested in thinking about how Jews at very different um, points of, in history, including our own point, have made sense of these verses. So I might be sympathetic uh, with you. I, I don't think this is a, you know, what the original text uh, meant, uh, but I do think um, it's fascinating and it is an account that has both a history, as we'll see, that came before it, and also a history that was spawned, right, from it, uh, from this idea. Okay. And I'd anyone? Like, I'd, like add, yeah. I'd like to add this, Kelsey. Um, there's, a, there's a phrase in, in the uh, short story, To Be a Man, that says, life is always happening on so many levels, hmm. all at the same time. So I think she's encapsulated what you just said in, in that sentence. Yes, thank you. I mean, Krauss is very interested in time um, and its multiple workings. Uh, this was actually, we discussed this when we talked about Forest Dark and sort of both the you know, divisions of space and time and things happening simultaneously. And there, you know, perhaps, you know, some metaphysical way of understanding the possibility that these two things could be true at the same time would be another, a very different approach, right? Brashid Rabba sees it not as happening at the same time, as a gradual process. First, right, there was a creature with two sexes, and then this was turned into, you know, two different creatures, right? But what you're saying is perhaps in some way, you know, double gendered and single gendered are, you know, simultaneously true. Maybe one other comment before continuing. Yes, um, I see somebody's hand. In the in the first version, when Adam was created, and then later the woman was created, you referred to Adam being an Earthling, and it's what I heard is that the essence of the woman it was different. It wasn't Earthling. It was they were substantially different cre creatures or creations. Yes, you're saying in Genesis 2. Do you mean in Genesis 2? Probably. Yes. So that actually is explored also in the Midrash. I didn't cite the passage, but the difference between Adam being created from earth, right? A certain earthiness to uh, the man and Chava being created from a bone, right? Is a whole, you know, source of fascinating exploration about differences in the genders. So Yes, I mean, if if we if we understand that Adam is earthy and Chava is something else, uh, bony or some other um, way of conceiving, so then that brings a whole other layer to the story, which is worth exploring. You have a now, a challenge between the two when they are androgynous, when they are one, when they are created from earth. There's an equality. Exactly. There's an equality. <laughs> the version where Adam names Eve, and then of course there's the two namings, um, and there is the establishment of patriarchy. Excellent. So this Agreed. is another thing, this is another thing that's much more present in the second chapter and was also um, a source of a lot of kind of midrashic exploration and without getting too far afield, right, the, the fairly well-known myth of Lilith um, emerged from that difference, right, in terms of equality. So um, as um, early medieval Midrashim tell the story, initially Adam had a wife before Eve who was equal to him, right? And this sort of reflects um, Breshit Aleph, right, Genesis 1. There was an equality between the genders and, um, or at least there was a demand for equality from, uh, from Lilith. And Lilith, um, when she did not receive the equality that was due to her, uh, ended up sort of leaving 
and all, all sorts of chaos ensued. And then Genesis 2 is um, a new wife who is subservient, right? Uh, both in terms of the narrative, um, kind of the order, uh, and also, uh, I'm glad you pointed that out, even in terms of the naming, right? Adam first named the animals, and then he named his wife. Who, someone who has the power to name, right, has more power. So the second chapter shows a kind of different hierarchical relationship between Adam, who is, you know, who is, who is more powerful, right, which seems to reflect a very patriarchal perspective, right? So there's I've always, that, yes. I've always wondered how different world history would be if we never had the second version. <laughs> it's an interesting thought experiment, um, but we have it. And one of the, I think, interesting things I wanna draw out today is that even if there are things that might initially, um, or even beyond initially bother us in some of these texts, um, they also capture something perhaps bothersome that exists in the world. Um, I won't go through all the quotes now from, um, from the book because I see time is moving very quickly, but there are you know, very detailed kind of explicit um, reflections in the story where Krauss even asks, is that okay? Right, in terms of describing the violence of sex um, with this man, um, um, you know, where within a certain frame, right, a, a kind of violence and domination, right, can, um, can be allowed to exist. And then, you know, of course, outside of that frame, the, you know, the two people need, can treat each other with, with respect, right? So the text, you know, might not reflect how most of us want our ideal society to look, right? We don't want, um, you know, the man with the whip, um, um, but, but it does reflect something that is present in culture, whether it's good or bad, um, in terms of gender relations. And we'll see this kind of recurring. I see one more hand, so yes. Uh, you, um, may I speak? Um, can you hear me? Of course, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, I, ju I just wanted to say, um, since you're, you're relating it to Kraus, Kraus that she seems to um, be subverting this the, th these very passages when she she has like a theme whether she as a woman um, um, whether it's she can be alone or whether she needs a man so mm -hmm. she's actually taking you know the 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 man was created I mean the woman was created so that Adam is not alone and she's she's thinking like what is she you know is she more free or is she more um, does she does she actually need a man besides for sex? She she's kind of uh, exploring that question. So it's kind of interesting yes. that the woman. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. She is exploring the very possibility of an uh, of an independent existence, and I think connected to that sort of subversion of of the biblical account is the fact that in a sort of inex inexplicable way, the female narrator has this you know, broken rib, right? right? And that rib is not, but first of all, it's in the female rather than in the male, which is very interesting. Right. Um, but also it's not the result of at least a known trauma, right? With the boxer, right? That rib was broken, right? In combat, right? There is an account of it. The narrator, the female and narrator his is- wife left him. His wife left him, so he's- He's also broken. Right. Yeah. And in a way, the narrator is sort of playing with it, but the narrator feels at least spiritually powerful, um, as she puts it, and, 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 and does see um, a way in which she's stronger. I mean, they kind of flirt a little about the possibility of boxing. And even if it's true, of course, this hulk of a person would, you know, would pummel her in an actual ring, it's clear that she's much stronger than him, right? He is, he is a broken he is a broken person, whether it's because of, you know, the, the German history, the traumas of the, uh, of the 20th century, or also the way in which he conducts his life. Now, I actually wanted to use this as, as an opportunity to just add something in terms of Krauss. And that is precisely the, the loneliness and the need for loneliness, right? We started by looking at um, and, and, and reading the classic account as a kind of romantic account 
right? Where he's finally, you know, he finds his mate, he finds his soulmate. And this is the way of the world. One, you know, a man leaves his house and, and cleaves to a woman and they become one flesh. But then I suggested that there's actually, um, this often doesn't work, uh, but, but there's, all, there's also some remaining tension precisely in the aloneness, right? A Adam in the story and the German still requires this solitude, right? And he does it, you know, it's, it's ruined his marriage, he realizes. All his wife wanted, right, was just to sleep next to him um, instead of him, him leaving. And he's incapable of sharing a bed, right, beyond the fleeting moments of the union, right? So there's something she's capturing there where he has this, you know, unhealthy, you know, independence, need to be alone. He can't sleep next to, you know, uh, the woman that he just has relations with. Well, she, right, she could, she could go either way. Right? She, the, the narrator has, you know, just a much more, you know, confidence and um, better perspective on her ability to be alone than this, this German. Okay, so I, 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 I don't want to belabor this, this section and this discussion, even though there's so much to say. I did want to just say one, one or two more things, and then we could kind of have a broader discussion. This Midrash might sound familiar to those of you who've studied um, classics uh, and even um, you know, philosophy. In Plato's Symposium, there is, um, of course, a set of dialogues. And uh, one of the most famous is Aristophanes' speech on Eros, right? On the meaning of love and how it works. I won't read this with you, but it is on the hand handout. This is source number four. And there's a very kind of similar, and scholars have explored what the relationship is between this old, you know, classical description of Eros and the Midrash. But we have a similar idea that the song a part of genders um, at one point in kind of primal history and then the coming together of the genders tells us something about, you know, at least, you know, the ideal form of love or in this case, as he describes it, heter heterosexual love, where, you know, when these two sides come back together, it's literally reverting to that primal state, right? But also some of the difficulties that come along the way and the dangers right, from these, these creatures reuniting. So I'll just leave that for you to kind of look at it your own time, but there's, there are even further la layers in, that are, you know, that are brought into this world by this Midrash that have echoes and kind of classical literature and, and, and elsewhere. Um, okay. I wanted to, before, yes. Monitoring the chat, and there was just an interesting question about to what extent does the author have, you know, is versed in in the text and Jewish literacy and Jewish learning. So I don't know if you want to kind of put that in as your sure. You say no. in terms of in, in terms yeah, of Krauss. Oh, like is she learned? Does she have a background? And and to what extent mm -hmm. might she be thinking of these as underlying as she crafts, or what's the process? If you know anything about it, I think. Thanks. That that's a that's an excellent question. So I mean. You know, first, generally in, in this forum, um, and I think Krauss is a great example, I'm not necessarily trying to deconstruct Krauss's process. In fact, that's not what I'm doing. Um, Krauss is not a nerdy, you know, Talmud scholar like myself, uh, who, you know, reads through all these different midrashim, gets very excited and writes a book. That's the reason why Nicole Krauss as a successful author of numerous novels and collections and I'm not, right? And often working that way is not, it just doesn't make good art, right? She is, however, she is learned. She, 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 she um, particularly the, the um, accounts that she keeps on coming back to, um, she has, you know, a lot to say about them. Um, these include the Akeda, um, and these also include the relationship between men and women. Um, she finds things in the text, I think, um, that sometimes you might have missed. And I think the problem of the aloneness of, you know, of uh, uh, of of the earthling of Adam is what after right the fact I think is activated there. I think she is saying something about that aloneness. 
one of, one of the things that I realized, you know, when learning through these sources after reading the book um, and thinking about even the title of the book, right? To be a man or the process of becoming a man, which is the theme of that story, right? Um, usually we read these sources, you know, Breshit, Bet, Aleph, as the story of how women came to be. I mean, that's what the account is, right? This is how there is women in the world, right? But actually, right, even in that traditional reading, it's just as much, if not more, about the invention of man, right? Because man uh, becomes different after woman is taken from him, right? Um, we think, at least initially, when we read these psukim, that he'll just be reunited with a sort of primal form of his, of his own, and the way the Midrash expresses it. But actually, in a way, the aloneness becomes even more problematic, right? The inability to share the bed outside of the union, which is expressed in the story, is only heightened, right? So, this, so Breshid Bet is not only or even primarily about how women came, came to be, but actually how man came, came to be, right? So that sort of thing I find like, you know, she's not a parshan, she's not a traditional commentator by any means, and she's not a tamidat chachamim. Um, I don't think she would be, you know, insulted if I were to say that to her, but, but her insight and her returning to specific sources, I think, you know, um, uncovers new, new layers. So, so I just want to very quickly, you know, mention something else that 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 also comes up in the story and is also um, present in this section. If we think of sort of the gender imbalance, where I th I can't remember who it was, um, but someone mentioned the gender imbalance of specifically Genesis chapter two. That is um, further compounded by. Um, after by the punishment for eating from the tree, right? So if even initially there's a kind of, um, um, you know, gender, uh, a, a hierarchy that's in place from the creation, right? That's even compounded by the punishment. Um, and this is verse number seven, where this phrase, and for your man shall be your longing and he shall rule over you. Now that phrase has generated quite a bit of um, exploration and even trouble. What exactly does it mean, right? Many of the things that the classic commentators say seem to be uh, qualities, at least in patriarchal society, right? That's supposed to be a curse, right? In a patriarchal society, there would be, yes, of course, you know, a woman should de desire her husband and he is the boss, right? It's sort of interesting how in our contemporary space, we say, well, this is obviously a curse, right? Um, the fact that society will be built this way. But in the medieval context, they said, how is this a curse? So I just want to quickly share a teaching by Nachmanides, um, a very important um, early medieval or medieval commentator. This is how he reads it. Again, this might strike you initially as, you know, difficult, even horrifying, but it does capture a certain truth that, that, that Krauss also explores. He says that he punished her, God punished her, that she should greatly desire husband and not fear the pain of childbearing and birth, and he will keep her as a maidservant, right? And it is not normal for a servant to want to buy a master for himself. Rather, he will want to flee from him. So Nachmanides is sort of linking the two parts of the verse, and he's saying kind of brilliantly that the curse about you know, the pains of childbirth are connected to the curse about longing, right, for a man and ruling over the woman, right? Because if the pain is so great, why would the woman, right, want to be with a man? Why would a woman ever want to bring children into the world, right? The pain is so tremendous. So this too is part of the curse, according to Nachmanides. And sort of the interplay of pleasure and pain which the Nachmanides is so beautifully capturing here is also explored by the crowd by Kraus and is also very much part of the, you know, the game of the mating game, right? In which these some of the men that we are introduced to in this in this book are, are terrible people. <laughs> they cause pain and suffering. And you know, the 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 women are not always sure why they seek love with these people, and yet they want something 
as troubling as it is, as cursed as it is, with these, you know, problematic relationships. So I think that, you know, that th further compounding of the gender imbalance um, is very powerful, um, is there, I think, in, in these sources and is also, um, is also explored by Crass. So I'm gonna stop the screen share for a little bit so we can discuss, because um, I can't see everybody's faces and I feel like I've been missing all of the wonderful um, chats because I just can't see them properly while I'm teaching, but hold on, let me, let me try to stop the screen share. There we go, okay. So are there, I see there are many thoughts in the, in the chat, but are there, are there any um, thoughts, pushback ideas that people wanna share verbally before we just consider one more story? You can just unmute. I saw a few hands. So I, Michael, if you wanna just unmute, I saw your hand, but anybody can just jump right in. I mean, I just want to say, like, I'm, I took such different things from the book, so I'm still digesting everything. But um, it seems like the persistent theme of so many of the stories is, can a woman be alone? Is it valid for a woman to be alone? And it's fascinating to look back at the sources where, you know, if you consider the classical sources to be the definitive line, it's just not even baked into the creation of the world. It's just not meant to be. Um, this and also if far as dark, I feel like, the legacy of her divorce just has not left her. I mean, I'm still, I don't know, I, I, I missed the first couple of minutes because of something else. So um, I don't know if this was just intended to be like only focused on Jewish sources, but I'm amazed that such a powerful and talented woman is still writing so explicitly with that shadow so many years later. Not that it ever leaves you the pain, but it's like she's still exploring this theme and trying to squeeze it out of most of the stories in this book. And I mean, that, she's really such an impressive human being <laughs> that it, it makes it all the more um, fascinating. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a good point. And, and the theme of aloneness, when I was sort of thinking about what to focus on, I did think about, you know, explicitly exploring the idea of whether, as the rabbis say, you know, um, it's, you know, the need, you know, of, of two bodies being together is better than even being in a terrible relationship, right? These sort of interesting and troubling statements that are out there. In terms though, it, you know, I don't know how biographical we want to get in terms of appreciating the book. One thing that should, in fact, must be kept in mind is that this is a collection um, and many of the stories go back many years. So, you know, we have the impression that in 2020, uh, you know, Nicole Krauss is still um, struggling mightily with her divorce from Jonathan Seth and Foyer, but there's a little bit of a, you know, mirage effect um, there. Um, at the same time, I think, yes, I mean, it's, forget about whether she's struggling with it and I'm not as interested in a kind of psychological reading um, or at least, uh, you know, biographical reading, but these are very powerful themes, right? Even for those of us who blessedly never had to experience anything like it, there's so much there that's worth going back to um, and worth prodding and maybe pulling scabs off to think about. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, no, I mean, just to, just to close the loop, it's, it's just fascinating. Like she, steam, she seems to, again, like squeeze out this alone theme, but it's as if she's saying like, no matter how much we try to pursue the solitary lifestyle or existence, it will never, the need for companionship, partnership will never elude us. Um, and it's, yeah, I, I mean, I I don't, the, the, the story of the husband was such an interesting, uh, like almost like a funny, it was like one of the few sort of light stories in there was such a funny take on it. Um, anyway, I know it's, it's, it's really interesting to think about when you take it back to the Bereshit sources, how this is just not the way life was meant to be. And yet she's on, it's like she's on this eternal search for a, like complete autonomy. 
or well, she's an eternal investigation into the con theme of autonomy. I say there are a lot of hands. I just want to just add one thing. No, no. First of all, I disagree with I disagree a little bit with your reading. I think she, you know, the men in those stories, uh, in that particular story, I should say, are unable of being alone, right? She, it's not easy, but she seems to be enjoying being alone. And I no. think even I think even in the biblical account, um, right? We talk about perspective. So much is focused on the problems of male aloneness, both before and after coupling. That right? There are ways of actually, you know, of the text, the biblical text, working harmoniously with this new lease on life that the female narrator has. I mean, right? you know, th there are many jokes about the curses, right? And one of them is, yeah, this is a curse that the woman has to, you know, um, be ruled over by her husband. But actually, who wants to be cursed? The same way you don't want to sweat when you work the fields, right? Which is Adam's curse. The woman should not have to be, you know, lorded over by her man. So the, I think the biblical text even doesn't say this is the way things need to be. I think the biblical text allows for the possibility this is a curse, right? That can be overcome um, as, as other curses can. So I see there are other hands. Um, yeah, Barbara. I, now I can't wait to read this book. I had uh, first asked the question about whether or not you had to read her books in succession because now as you're talking about how much of these books is about herself. Um, also, I will tell you that I am a divorced mother of uh, three, grandmother of four, and um, survived quite well, very you know, active in my synagogue and sisterhood and everything else. And um, so now I can't wait after these comments to read this book, but do you have to read her other um, to get to know her? I don't, I don't think so. And I, and I, I mean, I don't think um, I don't think you need to read the other books. I don't even think you need to know her personal narrative. Okay. I mean, we you have to be very careful when you read authors that speak in the first person and that clearly, um, you know, place within the book reason for you to believe that this is just their story. I mean, in some of her stories, she calls the narrator is known as Nicole, um, and there are you know there are things that come together. Um, you know, I invited her for a conference a few years ago. She came um, with a lovely young man, a uh, younger man that she was dating uh, to this conference. And she writes about that explicitly in her earlier fiction, right? Now that might lead you to think that the best way to read her books is biographical, but I think that the exact opposite is the case. You know, she wants, you know, she's speaking from places of experience, but she's trying to talk about things that you know, this is not memoir and this is not autobiography by any means. Okay. So feel free to read just this book and then the other ones later. And also, don't assume that she's you know just telling her life story because she's not. Right. Our book club meeting is tomorrow. We just did Einstein and the Rabbi searching for your soul. So, um, in a suggestion for another book, I thought this would be right, very interesting for many of us. Yeah. Them, yeah, it's great uh, to bring this one up. So. Definitely. So I see there are more hands. I do want to just, maybe we could leave those questions for just a bit. I want to very briefly talk about one other story. Um, the first story, Switzerland. Um, and then, then we could have time for, for more comments on both, on both stories and both sets of sources. So um, speaking of women who are um, confident um, and seemingly perhaps unbreakable or not, uh, the first story is, you know, an exploration of a, um, a young woman uh, from Iran and France that the narrator meets and um, goes and, you know, tests the limits um, in a uh, essentially dangerous relationship uh, with a businessman. Um, and, you know, without any spoilers, um, seems to emerge, perhaps not unscathed, perhaps more powerful, um, and perhaps after suffering um, quite traumatic experience, probably rape 
um, though it's not explicated in, in, the, um, in the book. So I wanted to, to think just for a few minutes and look at some sources um, that also resonate. These are not explicitly referenced in the way that you know, the ribs of Adam and Chava were referenced, but I do think sort of a kind of biblical um, rape scenes are, are present in this, in this story as well. So just very briefly, I don't know if we'll even read all of these. I just wanna um, highlight some of these, uh, these sources. Um, so the main source that I just wanna bring into the discussion, and you could take that up uh, or not, is the story that actually was just read um, in Shul about the rape of Dina, right? And this story uh, describes, right, I'll just read quickly, and Dina Leah's daughter, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to go seeing among the daughters of the land. And Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite prince of the land, saw her and took her and lay with her and abused her. And his very self clung to Dina, daughter of Jacob, and he loved the young woman and he spoke to the young woman's heart, right? So we have here an account of a rape, um, a abusive relationship, um, perhaps even a kidnapping and a rape, uh, if we wanna just you know, fully bring out what's, what's going on. Very troubling story. Um, and right, it's also interesting and troubling to see the way this text has, has been read. Now, Speaking of novels that have used biblical sources, right? This, these few lines and the lines that come after it were of course the source of one of the best known uh, uh, books that were read, read in Jewish book clubs over the last few decades. And I'm thinking of Anita Diamond's uh, The Red Tent, right? Which sort of retells the story of Dina from Dina's perspective and from the female perspective, right? Um, and, you know, The Red Tent is a sort of recapturing of um, perhaps occluded female voices uh, in the Bible. And there's a whole genre of these, uh, of these attempts and they're really interesting uh, to, to think about. The, you know, on the one hand, those subversive readings are very powerful, right? What happens if we don't read it in terms of, you know, Jacob's sons trying to rescue this, this damsel sister in, in distress? But rather, you know, what happens when we think about Dina falling in love with this man, right? And, right, that, you know, subversive way of reading has been very powerful. But I think it's almost too easy, right? And I think these psukim capture the complexity um, of, first of all, rape, but also whether this is rape or not in front of us, both in the crowd story and in this, uh, and the, and in this story. And I'll, 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 I'll sort of point out a few things and then we can discuss it. One is this word went out to go, right? So if you're reading as sort of, you know, from a patriarchal perspective in the Middle Ages, that word is going to be flagged, right? And in fact, Rashi, the classic commentator, uh, says that the same way that her mother, you know, was a kind of go-getter, um, she went against the grain. She went and asked Jacob to sleep with her. Right. So similarly, her, you know, her daughter, Dina, act the same way. She knew what she wanted. Right. She went out, um, even if that wasn't accepted in uh, in society. So the character in the Krauss story um, is, you know, is a very powerful young woman um, who who knows what she wants. Right. She's a, you know, Yitzanit, right. Someone who goes out. In, in the way that Rashi uh, describes. Um, but reading from that perspective often leads to the conclusion, right? That she goes out and she pays for it, right? And she is abused and kidnapped. And, right, there are, there are plenty of problems in reading the story in that way, certainly in terms of blame, but even beyond that, in terms of appreciating the complexity of the story, um, it doesn't, you know, there's so much more that seems to be happening. So that's why I just want to highlight a kind of another um, sort of strain in reading the story that we can discuss. And this is, um, you know, and again, in the direction of Anita Diamond, um, but not all the way, right? That there's a complexity here. So Ibn Ezra, uh, another uh, very influential medieval commentator, 
says on the one hand, what does it mean that she goes out? He highlights that word, right? By herself, from herself. She makes her own decisions, right? Um, what about the pain? It seems that she's abused. He sort of erases that or at least lessens that. <clears throat> he says that this is the first time that she had sex. So it was painful, right? And he goes on to say, you know, to kind of paint a sympathetic uh, portrait of the man here um, by saying that he spoke to her soft and consoling matters, right? Now, that might be a shocking read, but there is something there in the text that suggests that this is Dina wanted, you know, something else. She wanted to leave the family in which she might have, you know, she needed to go out from. Um, and, um, and, and beyond that, the other clue is the fact that Shechem is described as loving her, right? He loves her, right? And this is contrasted with perhaps the most famous biblical rape, the story of Amnon and Tamar. So without reading this, um, it's in front of you, after this horrific rape between Amnon and Tamar, he kicks her out of the room. He doesn't want to see her anymore. And Amnon hated her with a very great hatred, for greater was the hatred for which he hated her than the love which he had loved her, right? And he tells her to get up and go, right? You know, e you know even beyond the horrific rape is this pure hatred um, that um, the rabbis read as a reflection of the fact that he never really loved her, right? He loved her, his love was dependent on something, right? Meaning that it wasn't a profound love for the person. He just wanted, you know, whatever physical thing he wanted to do to her, right? But there wasn't anything there. And this is, seems to be contrasted with the language that we read in the story. So what I wanna put out there and we can discuss now is the extent to which um, the story of Dina should be read as the rape of Dina and whether there's a sort of mixture of both abuse and a self-possessed woman wanting some of the things that she's getting outside of the home, whether Shem's actions are just, you know, from A to Z, pure rape and utterly horrific, or is there something else that simultaneously dwells with that, um, where there's something like love, which is what the text tells us. Right? These are sort of troubling things that the parshanim, that the commentators find in the text, but I think they're there. And I think Krauss does an amazing job of exploring from a female perspective, really, um, movement into these dangerous spaces, um, movement into and ultimately out of these, these dangerous spaces. But could I say something here? Just, yeah, it seems please. to me that, that um, you know, Vaya Anunu or whatever, the, the expression that's used is, is always, at least according to David Silber, uh, very, very bad. And I, I agree with him there. And uh, he, 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 he raped her. That seems to me pretty clear, I think. However, what it says afterwards, that you underlined here also, is they both seem to have changed after that, you know, uh, and uh, it's not necessarily ideal situation, but uh, nevertheless, it sounds to, it could be, it could be when he, when it says uh, he spoke to her heart. I don't know if that means, if that's just from his standpoint or if that expression can mean that she uh, took it in also and, and mm. might've been uh, responsive to him. Yeah, again, I think that I agree with you. I think that Ibn Ezra, you know, goes really too far in just saying that this was the pain of, you know, uh, virginal sex. Um, it, it means abuse, um, but I, I was sort of using him to kind of help us like see layers in which she might have sought something that she, um, or, or perhaps she ended up, you know, being a, a, a appeased by him, perhaps Stockholm syndrome, perhaps something else. But again, there is this sort of complex mixture of, um, of violence um, and love and um, desire and being forced, which, you know, is, is deeply troubling. Um, it, there's no kind of easy, this is not Anita Diamond's Red Tent. I mean, there are things happen that, that they are. This is not just, yes, this love story of a, of a girl who, who, who wants to be with this man and, and can't be. There's, both things are happening at the same time. So I'm gonna stop this screen share so I can see everybody.
And then I'd love to get comments on this, um, on, on, on either this story and this passage, on the other one, or even kind of more general comments um, on the book. Because again, there's just so much. We barely even touched two stories. And there's just so much to, to talk about. Yeah, Lewis. Well, I, I was, I have two points. One on, on the Dina story, I, you know, the, the redactors here made a special point of putting the abuse before the love. And I, I think that speaks to it in, in a big way. I mean, they could have solved all these problems by flipping, by flipping those two sentences, but they didn't. So what do you so what do you think that means then? In other words, the fact but that to me person... it means that that she was raped. And I, I I don't think it's unequivocal though. I do, you know. We read this in Shul this week, and we discussed this a little bit. And then there was the question of, you know, did Tina go out looking for something? So I guess I I have to appreciate how that balances with with the notion that she was raped. But um, back to Back to the Krauss story, I, I, I think that, you know, that I, I thought of this story while I was reading, you know, I thought of Dina as I was reading that. And, and I, to me, the, she was not Dina. There wasn't a perfect parallel that I forget the, the woman's name in the story, but um, I, I, she definitely went out, you know, with, a, with an ulterior motive. <laughs> Where, where I didn't, my reading of Dina is that it didn't happen that way, that it was, that, that she Pure was rape. perfectly yeah. raped. And um, just to change the subject a little bit, I, I was hoping maybe as a father of two sons, I was hoping that you would, there would be a, a biblical reference to the very last part of the last story where Krauss dis discusses sort of this, um, you know, moment when her sons stop being children and become become men, and I was wondering if there, you know, I'm I'm not enough of a scholar to, you know, be able to pick off a a, a, a Talmudic or a biblical um, incident that would parallel that. So mm. perhaps uh, if somebody has one, they could let me know because I, I I found that a very you know, my kids are now 30 and 35. So it's been a while, but I do sort of recall them, you know, you see your kids every day and then one day you wake up and you realize that they're very different than they were. And um, I was hoping to get some uh, exegesis, I guess, <laughs> on that. So if anybody has any, please let me know. Thank you. Other, other comments or thoughts that maybe we could come back to some of that if we have more time. I remember there were also comments in the first story that I, I cut people off from. So if you wanna go back to that, that's also great. I just wanna jump in on something, Lewis, a comment that you made just to build it out a bit more in terms of Dina and, um, and Soraya in the story, because I think you know, there's something to be said that yes, she went out and desired this relationship, but the power differential in that story is what makes it you know, whether we technically call it rape or not, what there is just, this is a high school student with an older man. And so I feel like when I think of Dina, less so than the story of Amnon and Tamar, that's a much more complicated familial relationship where the power differential is not as just, you know, large a gap. But um, in, in Dina and Shlem, there is that sense also of a power differential or not. But I think that's a key piece here in reading that story. You can give whatever motives you want to a young woman, but at the end of the day, she's 16. So I think, or 17 in this story. So I think that was uh, you know, one piece. And that, Shai, I don't know if anybody else picked up on this. I'll just throw it out there. I, I mentioned it to Shari, actually. In a lot of the narratives, the men um, are scholars, right? Not all, but you have a mathematician, philosopher, a, friend, a historian, and I mean, maybe because I'm in a relationship with a scholar, <laughs> I kind of read these stories and say, what is this? Or you know, why is it that the men and the women are not? They're accomplished therapists, doctors, but not there. You don't have that same scholarship. And so to me, I read the collection there as this very subtle reflection on, okay, what does it mean to be a man? 
the men in these stories are holding a position that none of the women in the stories are holding in terms of just their academic pursuits and the mathematician expertise. I mean, I, I, I think there's much to play with both in terms of also the Torah piece and the Talmudic scholarship and how that comes to play both in terms of what we view as a community, as being a man, um, and perhaps what she does. So I don't know if anybody else that that jumped out to you or that's my personal read living with a scholar. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd love to hear other people's comments, but uh, but I but uh, just on the first thing that you said, uh, I think right. Of course, right. In terms of the power differential, um, <laughs> the relationship between Soraya and that businessman, whether or not she desired it or felt that she desired it, is absolutely horrifying. But that's too easy, right? What Krauss is exploring the the genuinely powerful, she might only be 18 or 19 years old, but this genuinely powerful young woman, which, you know, in her essence sort of troubles Krauss's, you know, clean cut way or the narrator's clean cut way of sort of looking at the world, right? Um, I think, you know, the end of that story, I, I, by the way, I mean, that's my favorite story collection, the whole story. I read it, uh, in the New Yorker, even before the book came out, and I immediately emailed her and I said, "This is a perfect story um, because she doesn't solve the problem. She doesn't just say, "Yes, you know, this businessman is um, is um, you know, it's just a terrible person." I wish I could. Let me just read the last line because I think it, <laughs> uh, I think it 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 expresses the. The, the, the possibility, um, it, she write, he wrote, so Soraya with her downy mustache, I didn't even talk about the masculinity factor, but the power is expressed in a kind of masculinity. And her winged eyeliner and her laugh, that deep laugh that came from her stomach when she told us about the Dutch banker's arousal. He could have broken her in two with one hand, but either she was already broken or she wasn't going to break, right? So, he, she leaves open the possibility that she wasn't going to break and that she never did break. When she comes back after this ordeal, you know, of days, she seems to come back with her, you know, with her, her spine erect. Um, so I'm sorry, I've spoken too much. I'd love to hear either reactions to that or, or other reactions. Yeah, uh, Kelsey. Um, the story that I really want to reread is the one about Zussia, um, Zussia on the roof. You know, that one had had a lot of depth about. You know, we're talking about the men and the women. This was more about the man's perspective and uh, his his connection to that uh, the thing that uh, was mentioned earlier about. A man's knowledge, his his connection to his position and his his uh, you know, depth of of um, you know connection, where um, he kept say, she kept saying that uh, you know I object to the burden. Was, was something that, that uh, he said. And, and that objection to the burden of being the man, of being the one who, who has to transmit all of that, that, that knowledge and information seemed a very, very difficult uh, curse almost. Yeah, thank you. I, I mean, that's, that's sort of the most Jewish um, uh, story in the collection. It's also very Rothian, <laughs> both in kind of the sort of character, you know, characterized um, Jewish man, the focus on circumcision and its problems. And I'd love to discuss that, but I just, I, I thought that we would look at these other stories, but yes, definitely what to, what to think about there. Any other sort of parting? Just, yeah, just, I'm sorry. Just a parting thought is the last line in, in Future Emergencies where it says, she had simply gotten used to wearing it had grown to like it, in fact, and was reluctant to part with it now and go back to walking around with a naked face, exposed to everything. That seemed so pertinent to our, our 
masking our, our hidden faces these days. Yes. Very, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's also, that story is there. also so powerful in terms of the masks that we all wear, but it, particularly this older professor. The other biblical text that I really wanted to get into, but just because of time and the stories that I selected couldn't, is the, is the relationship between David HaMelech, King David and Abishag and his sort of use of this younger woman um, to keep him warm. And then, you know, the capital that that relationship has also for, you know, pretenders to the throne after him. You know, some of the problematics of that, you know, that sort of relationship are present in some of the things we've discussed now, but especially in that story you mentioned, Kelsey, with this older professor and, you know, this, this younger woman. So thanks. Okay. So I think we've, we've had a really good hour and a half long discussion. Um, it was such a pleasure as always to hear from you and learn from you and, and uh, to see you. And thank you for, you know, for coming and giving of your precious Sunday. And uh, I hope everyone, you know, stays well and healthy. Keep on reading and especially keep on learning. I just say on behalf of uh, Idra, thank you all for coming. And it's what a joy it is to have Shai teach us, just an amazing facilitator, and to have 929 as part of this project as well. And, and um, it really, it like lightens the whole week. Thank you so much. Thank you. Happy Hanukkah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Well, if you register, then you'll be on our various email lists, 929 Indra, so that we can send you further information about upcoming salons, events, classes, series. Uh, in the meantime, we have resources for you to explore, at least the biblical narratives, not the midrashic, but um, for further exploration. And just thank you for reading together. We hope everyone stays well and we'll be in touch. Thank you. Okay.